Hi, this is Brian Kim. I want to share with you this case of a patient who had an IOL exchange and I performed my modified demonic technique. He sought me from outside the state. He saw my YouTube videos and realized he needed a scleral fixated lens. He didn't feel like there was anyone in the area that was experienced with this technique. So he came up to Georgia to see me and he had a dislocated IOL with a haptic pointing and touching the cornea, causing corneal edema through his peripheral iridectomy. He actually was a phakic for a long period of time, had a secondary IOL placed in a sulcus, but apparently it became dislocated. The haptic was pointing through the peripheral iridectomy and was causing damage to his cornea. So this is the patient's eye. You can see there's quite a bit of corneal edema. I'm marking the limbus and then making sure I mark 180 degrees across from it. And then I'm using the tip of this cannula to create really distinct and discrete corneal marks. In order to do that, you have to have a really dry surface. I'm going to go two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus, and then I'm going to mark from that limbal mark straight back in radial fashion. And then I'm using the cannula to mark that spot. Again, that's two and a half millimeters posterior from that spot. And then I'm going to mark two millimeters adjacent to that spot. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, again, making sure that the surface is completely dry, the eye is in the neutral position. In other words, 2.5 millimeters is 2.5 millimeters in this position. I'm going to try to pass the scleral needles while the eye is in this position. So I go ahead and mark two and a half millimeters posterior and two millimeters adjacent. I'm indenting the sclera four millimeters posterior to the limbus with the back end of the trocar. Tunneling tangentially with the trocar and then diving in about two and a half millimeters. I'm using my blade to make my paracentesis incisions now. And this is my incision to externalize the leading haptic for the trailing haptic first modification for the Yamani technique. And this is going to be my incision for the anterior chamber maintainer. So I'm injecting some inch camera lidocaine of course, this patient is blocked. I'm going to place the AC maintainer. This is a 20 gauge AC maintainer. It's very important to get a really tight fit. You can see it took a little bit of effort, and that's a good thing. Injecting some intracameral triamcinolone, and you can see there's real no obvious vitreous in the anterior chamber. Inject some viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium. I'm going to make my triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, place the blade into the deep part of the groove, and then enter. Because I have the AC maintainer, I have a pretty firm globe doing it this way. So here I'm going to use a two-handed technique, inching across with two forceps, lifting up that first haptic. Grasping the end of the optic and then reaching around to find the subincisional haptic. And then using a two-handed technique to very carefully lift it up into the anterior chamber. The haptic just kind of broke off and so I just decided to take it out. That's why it's, it's very dangerous to try to use lenses that have been in the eye for a long time. Those haptics are very brittle. Starting to bisect the lens optic 
with the scissors. This is a silicone lens, so it's not easily grasped with the non-toothed forceps, so I switch and grab it with the tooth forceps, trying to rotate it so it goes into the anterior chamber so I don't lose that piece of the optic. Grasping that other haptic. Oh, and then the haptic just broke off again. And then I'm grasping the other end of the optic there. So I'm doing the vitrectomy, but this is in 4X speed. Just wanting to make sure that you are aware that this part can be tedious, but this needs to be thorough. You don't want to have any vitreous in the anterior aspect of the vitreous space where you're going to be passing those needles into the anterior vitreous space with the Yamani technique. So I'm just going around with the Maltzman, retracting the iris, making sure I remove any capsular bag remnants and looking for any potential lens material. Same thing here with the Sinsky retracting. I'm bending my needle. This is my right needle. I go about nine millimeters from the tip and angle it about 70 to 80 degrees, making sure the bevel is going to face towards the approach of the needle, which is gonna to be towards me. That's the right side needle. This is the left side needle. It's going to be bent at the hub, and that's going to be the second needle, and it's going to point away from me. Again, the bevel is always going to face the approach of the haptic. We're going to inject the C2 Lucia lens. As it's going in, my assistant is delivering the lens. I'm going to grasp it with the micro forceps. As she's dialing the lens in, I externalize the leading haptic. I go ahead and take over at this point and I start to deliver the lens myself, make sure the optic comes out planar, make sure the leading haptic continues to come out and delivered outside of the eye, and then sweeping the trailing haptic to the right. Injecting some dispersive viscoelastic to create some space between the lens and the cornea. Reposit the trailing haptic within the incision in a U-shaped configuration. Using forceps to hold the trocar, I'm very carefully tunneling the needle through the sclera two millimeters and then diving down. Using forceps to grasp the trailing haptic at the apex of the U. Placing the haptic on the bevel of the needle, docking it, flattening it out, and it goes in quite nicely into the needle. Disengaging the needle from the syringe. You want to internalize a little bit more than half of the haptic within the needle. I'm just making sure that the optic is underneath the iris there because it was catching it there. I'm going to internalize the leading haptic with the micro forceps, place it into the angle, and then using the left side needle, holding the incision with the forceps, holding the eye in the neutral position, tunneling two millimeters, and then diving in making sure the eye is in the neutral position the entire time, using micro forceps to grasp the leading haptic. The bevel is facing away from me. It's facing towards the approach of the bevel of the needle. But in this case, you can see that the pupil came down quite a bit. And so I'm not able to easily visualize the haptic and the needle in this situation. So I actually lost the haptic right there. And so I decided to go ahead and place some iris hooks and make some stab incisions. And then I'm gonna go ahead and place some iris hooks in there. And so that's the other key. If your view is not really very good, 
don't hesitate to use something to retract the iris. It'll just make your life a lot easier. So I'm twirling the hook, engaging it, and then pulling the stopper down. Doing it one more time here. Good, and as I do this, you can see the leading haptic quite nicely right there. So I'm gonna place the microforceps into the eye and very gently place it back into the anterior chamber. And then we're gonna start over again. I'm gonna hold the incision with my forceps, holding the sclera in the neutral position, tunneling through the sclera and then diving down. You saw that the eye collapsed a little bit and that's because I was holding the incision and it caused the wound to gape. I'm gonna grasp the haptic Again, I have to flatten out the haptic, but the bevel is facing the approach of the haptic. I flatten it out on the bevel of the needle, dock it, and it goes in quite nicely there. Going to flatten it out and start to withdraw the needle. As I do this, the haptic comes out. I grasp it with microforceps quickly and then cauterize the tip. I go to the other side and do the same thing as well. Pulling the needle out, straight back. Once the haptic comes out, grasp it with forceps and then quickly transition to the cautery and create a nice little bulb at the end. I'm gonna internalize the haptic making sure that the flange is flush to the sclera and then reapproximate the conjunctiva. Go ahead and take out the iris hooks. And then this is going to be the vitrector assisted peripheral iridectomy. I'm in the PI mode. You can see the aspiration rate is very low. Vacuum is high. Cut rate is at 30. This creates a very well-controlled and very small, discrete and precise peripheral iridectomy. Go ahead and place a suture through the main incision, which I always do whenever I'm working with the vitreous space to ensure there's no vitreous that wants to come to the wound. I'm gonna to start to remove the viscoelastic with the ironing handpiece. Go back in with the AC maintainer and then remove any potential vitreous that might be in the anterior chamber, as well as in the vitreous space again. I just feel like using the vitrector to remove the viscoelastic, the, especially the dispersive viscoelastic, is just really inefficient. And so I just switched to the INA handpiece. It's just a lot more efficient to remove the viscoelastic. And then if there is any vitreous, just go back with the vitrector and deal with it then. But thankfully I did a really thorough vitrectomy early on, so I didn't really have any obvious vitreous coming forward. I make sure I sweep the subincisional iris, making sure there's nothing coming to the incision with the cannula. And then last but not least, injecting some more intracameral triamcinolone in case there is any potential invisible vitreous that's there and thankfully there is none. So I go ahead and uh, close the incision.
And that'll be the end of the case. I'll take the AC maintainer out, take the trocar out, bury my knot. Again, this is a patient who, uh, again, sought my care from out of state. He came to see me for consultation for a dislocated IOL. He actually had recurrent macular edema and he was wondering his lens, uh, the cause for his macular edema. At the time, he didn't have corneal decompensation. So I was like, you know, it's possible. And he was contemplating uh, IOL exchange, but didn't really commit at that time, tried to optimize the macular edema treatment. And then of course, uh, unfortunately, he did develop corneal decompensation and that's what really kind of accelerated his timeline to have this surgery. And so again, he had a sulcus lens, it was clearly dislocated and the haptic was pointing through the PI and causing a problem rather than trying to save that lens. You saw that the lens just kind of fell apart as I was handling the lens. The haptic just broke off the optic. Both of them did that. It was just really better to explant the two lenses, do a thorough vitrectomy, and then do a Yamani technique. Hopefully this will address the patient's recurrent CME issue. I also informed the patient that he will probably need to have endothelial keratoplasty at some point. Of course, he has to recover from this surgery first, and I, I suspect that once he has the endothelial keratoplasty, he should do quite well. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.